Is this working? Yes. So hello everyone, I'm Pierre Krieger, or Krieger, whatever you want to pronounce it. Um, this is what I don't look like, but this is my profile picture on Twitter. That's how you might recognize me. And I'm going to answer a question. Is a Rust conference, read a Rust conference, if you don't have a talk about asynchronous Rust? Uh, this talk is about the history of asynchronous Rust, futures, Mio, Tokyo, where we are now, what's the future, and importantly, how to compile that into Wasm that runs in the browser. That's the shining part. Uh, first of all, a history lesson. So how did we get where we are here? Uh, back in 2014, you had actually a runtime. Rust had a runtime. You had two kinds of threads. Green, um, you had two kinds of runtime. Green threads on system threads. Sorry. Uh, you have lib native if you wanted green threads. You have, you had, uh, sorry, you had lib green if you wanted green threads. You have lib native if you wanted native threads. And you basically had to choose between the one you wanted. This has been later removed because we decided to orient Rust to be a very low level language that should not have a runtime. And therefore, green threads were removed because of that. A bit later, Mio got released till in 2014, according to crates.io. Mio is an abstraction over. Oops. My cells are not in sync. And yeah. Mio is an abstraction on top of EPOL and it's equivalent of Windows, which I don't know the name of. Step one, you create an event loop. Step two, you create your sockets. Step three, you register your sockets. Step four, you, you put the current thread to sleep until your sockets are ready. And that made it possible to use non-blocking sockets, which was not possible before. Without that, you need one thread per connection. Thanks to Mio, you don't need that anymore. People started writing high-performance Rust libraries on top of that which is great, but in practice, Mio is extremely difficult to use. Which brings us to 2016, Futures and Tokyo. Futures is a generic library about the concept of asynchronous Rust. Tokyo is a library slash framework, whatever you want to call it, on top of Mio to make, to make this easy to use. And I'm going to explain a bit later how that all works. Don't worry about that. Then 2018, you have New Tokyo, which adds to the confusion. So the Crate Tokyo itself is New Tokyo, but Tokyo Core is Old Tokyo. And for example, Tokyo Timer 0.1 is Old Tokyo and 0.2 is New Tokyo. So kind of hard to like understand all this, but here we are. Uh, the new Tokyo added support for the file system and made some API changes, which I'm not going to go into details here. Then a bit later, future 0.2 and 0.3, oh, sorry about that. 0.2 and 0.3. Um, what we call futures nowadays, future 0.1. But there, there's also 0.2, which got released, but then yanked because we realized that it would split the ecosystem in two. Bad idea. And then future 0.3, which is actually not future 0.3, it's future stash preview, which is now getting stabilized into the standard library. And no one actually uses it. Everyone uses future 0.1, and futures preview is mostly for experiments and for stabilization. Like someone disagrees, but that's the case for me. Uh, rule number one, we don't talk about future 0.2, that doesn't exist. Don't mention that. <laughs> Which brings us to present time. So I explained all the mess we are here in, kind of. And this is where we are right now if you want to write asynchronous rest. We have Tokyo and futures. Oh. Disclaimer, stable Rust, because nightly is something else. I'm going to get to it later. That's stable Rust, Tokyo and futures. So I'm going to ex shit. I'm going to explain how futures work. Futures has two concepts. One, the future trait, two tasks. I need your attention because that's like going to be a bit complicated. 
There's other concepts like streams and things, but they are kind of secondary. I'm going to explain futures and tasks. You implement the future trait on objects that have a value that's going to be known in the future. And a task is basically a thread, a green thread, a lightweight thread, whatever you want to call it, a thread. In order to resolve the value that a future will provide, you call futures execute or spawn, which creates an object named spawn. It associates a future with a task. Then you call the method on spawn, and these methods are going to set up some thread local storage thingy and then call Paul on the future. The future can then grab the current task by calling uh, futures task current, which reads from a thread local storage. And if a future is not ready to give out its value yet, it stores the current task in memory and notifies it later once it's ready. That's the complicated part. But on top of that, you have Tokyo. Tokyo makes this uh, theoretically easy to use. Uh, Tokyo is what provides the scheduler. It's, it's what controls the tasks, what controls the order in which tasks are being executed, what actually executes tasks. So you just give futures to Tokyo by calling Tokyo um, spawn or Tokyo run, and Tokyo does the rest. Um, in addition to the current task thread local storage, Tokyo also has its own thread local storage thingy in order to store its own runtime, which provides a clock, which provides the networking capabilities, which provides the executor, and so on and so forth. Uh, in order to illustrate that, um, that's going to be extremely painful for me, but I'm going to ex illustrate that. Here is how it works. So you have two threads, which are idle at the moment. We call, oops, we call Tokyo run on that future. Tokyo starts running that future, calls the poll method on it. Um, the poll method returns not ready. So the future grabs the current tasks and stores it inside of itself. Then, um, yep, that's what I just explained. The future is put on hold, stores the handle. Then, for the sake of the example, we spawn two more futures that are getting executed. They are also put on hold because they are not ready yet. Then later, some external mechanism can be a background thread, can be anything, uh, grabs the task handle from a future that is ready and calls notify on it, which tells Tokyo that it should run again this future. Then, for the sake of this example, we also notify the two other futures, which are getting scheduled for execution. Then, future two says not ready. It's getting put on hold again with a handle, and so on and so forth. That's how it works. Uh, Tokyo also provides some other utilities, which I mentioned for the sake of mentioning. Um, provides non-blocking networking capabilities. I don't know why I wrote that in my slides, but you get the point. Um, the socket types, but yeah, Tokyo provides the networking because you cannot use the standard uh, network thingies. You are supposed to use the ones from Tokyo because the ones from Tokyo read from the thread local storage and register themselves on Tokyo. Um, how are you supposed to use futures right now? You're supposed to create one of the given primitives, which are sockets, file system operations, timers, channels, basically primitives, the very low level stuff, and then apply combinators on them similar to iterators, so that map dot and them dot select dot join and so on and so forth. You call combinators on them, you group your futures together until you get a big future, then you pass that to Tokyo run or Tokyo.spawn. That's how you're supposed to use it. Uh, how I actually use future, not like that. Um, and why? For several reasons. Uh, futures can potentially, you cannot express a future that never ends. You cannot express a stream that never ends. You cannot express a future or a stream that never returns a, an error because polling always returns a result. Also, I am not using combinators because error messages. 
Um, like I've been using asynchronous Rust since October 2017. I still cannot get around using combinators uh, without running into that. Um, another issue with combinators is what's the type of out you call foo dot select dot map dot blah 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 blah, and now what's the type of out? How do you put that in a struct? Like you cannot solution use a box, but that's a runtime overhead, and that's kind of crappy. You also have this issue with do you use a box that implements send and sync or not? Causes tons of issues. And in order to solve that, what I'm personally doing with futures is just write futures by hand. So it looks kind of crappy solution, but what I mean by hand is you write explicitly imper future for your type, and you write the poll method yourself, and you do the polling manually. That solves everything, and I recommend do that if you want to actually use futures in production right now. It sucks, but that's what I actually recommend. Uh, just make care if you return not ready that you actually have all your internal futures return not ready as well. Otherwise, they may they, ne they may never wake up as illustrated by the image. Also, you don't actually need to use the future trait. Like the point of futures is polling, but why implement future? You don't need that. You can just have a regular method that's called poll and document that it's supposed to be called the way future poll is supposed to be called. And then you can use the poll fn method. The advantage of that is that, for example, in, this, in here, poll does not return a result. Poll directly returns an async object, cannot error. You can actually express in the type system that foo cannot return an error by being polled, contrary to implementing the future trait. Uh, that's what I just described. You can create infinite futures, you can create infinite streams, you can create futures on streams that never error, and also polling can borrow the object that's being polled contrary uh, to implementing the future trait, which makes this zero cost. And which brings us to WASM. And I'm going to answer the second question. Is a Rust conference really a Rust conference without a talk about WASM? Uh, the answer is no, although I'm not the only talk about WASM. So. Uh, there are three challenges if you want to compile an application that uses asynchronous Rust to WASM for the browser. Uh, number one, Tokyo is not available, um, and we actually cannot port Tokyo to the browser because it assumes that you can sweep the current thread, which you can't. Um, you can, however, use traits like async write, async read, uh, that's not bounding, doesn't require anything, they are just basic traits. Uh, Tokyo Spawn doesn't work, obviously, because there's no background executor or anything like that. Uh, challenge number two, STD time does not work. STD time instant and system time don't work because the standard library thinks the operating system is unknown and it does not know how to retain the time. If you try to use them, you get a panic. That sucks. But that's the design decision of a Rust team, which, uh, which I actually think is good. It's a good thing that they provide the standard library, but some things panic. And challenge number three, obviously, sockets do not work. You cannot use TCP stream, UDP stream, because your browser cannot use TCP or UDP. Um, so how to solve challenge number one? Tokyo does not work. The Wasm bind gen future crate provides future do to promise, to promise, sorry, uh, which magically converts, well, it's not magic, but for the sake of the talk, it's magic. I don't want to, to dig into the details. It turns your future into a promise, into a JavaScript promise. So you write your create as a library and not as a binary. You write your create as a library and one of the, like the main method of your library returns a promise. And you return that to the JavaScript side. The JavaScript side, like the JavaScript the browser, will actually execute your future. Um, in order to solve Tokyo Spawn not working, what I'm doing is uh, 
I still use the executor capabilities of Tokyo, but with a backup mechanism. What I mean by that is that on WASM environments, the executor will return an error. On non-WASM environment, it will work. So what you have to do is just use that and have a fallback in case of error, which is, in my opinion, a good solution because you don't have to explicitly say if WASM else, you just rely on whether there's an error or not. Uh, so you put your box, you put your future in a box. You call dot spawn or spawn. If it returns an error, you get back the future and you add this to a list of futures that you pull manually. So later, when your main future runs, it pulls the thing that would normally be in the background. Uh, challenge number two: SD time and Tokyo timer, which I didn't mention. Tokyo timer obviously does not work either. Uh, they all panic. What I did to solve that uh, pragmatic solution, I have a WASM timer crate which abstracts over that. So on non-WASM platforms, it's going to use SD time or Tokyo timer. And on WASM platform, it's going to assume that we are within a browser and use the JSCs and WebCs crates. Kind of crappy, you have to change your entire code. You cannot use SD time, you have to use WASM timer but that's the pragmatic solution until we find a proper solution. Challenge number three, sockets do not work. Uh, obviously the browser can only support WebSockets or WebRTC. The solution to that, there's no solution. You cannot use, net, you cannot use any networking sockets from within your code. So you have to provide an API using WASM Bindgen and implement it in JavaScript. At least that's what I did. Uh, there's a link to an example here, which I'm not going to open, but if you are quick to type, you can check it out. Um, and yeah, similarly to the executor error thingy, uh, what I did is the concept of an external networking system exists in both WASM and non-WASM environment. In practice, you only use it in WASM, but again, the objective is to not write if WASM something else, something else. You just assume that, the, like, you just use the same code everywhere. Uh, demo time. So, So sorry if you're watching on YouTube, you just missed two minutes. But um, And this is the same thing compiled for the browser. And it works. Here I am. Uh, which way am I? am I? Browser node. Syncing uh, way slower. Um, it's got a ton of problems, but it's the same code. It's several dozens of thousands of lines of code. And it just works. So, like what I just explained works. <laughs> well, you're supposed to be impressed. <laughs> Thank you, I, I hope you clapped because you were impressed and not because I, I was sarcastic.
Okay. Um, and that brings us to the future. I don't have my slides anymore. Ah. Okay, sorry for that. Which brings us to the future. So what's going to happen in the future? Oh yeah, I didn't comment on the pun, but yeah. Uh, what's going to happen in the future? First of all, stable futures. That's coming next Thursday, so that's pretty soon. Uh, Rust 1.36, futures are getting stabilized, SCD future. That's great as well. You can upload the Rust standards uh, library team if you want. <laughs> uh, I wrote Tokyo Master Branch up today. That's maybe not actually true. That uh, need to be checked. I'm not sure. There's no stream. There's no sync. There's no. There's not all combinators. That's on purpose. They are just stabilizing the the most straightforward things and stream sync. Things may not exist in the end. Streams may exist in a different way. Um, needs more thoughts. And it's the same as futures preview. Uh, then async awaits. Uh, Scadder to be released on August 15th. There's a pull request that got opened a few days ago. Not a pull request, actually an issue that got opened a few days ago, which proposes to stabilize that. And hopefully it's going to happen unless someone finds something major, which would not happen. Uh, async await, so I'm kind of assuming that everyone has seen what async await is. It lets you write like green threads as if they were regular functions. You can do basically the same as combinators, but in an actually usable way without running into weird errors. Um, when creating uh, async await, uh, the core team are, has realized an issue about that. Um, it's actually undefined behavior to yield from a coroutine if you have an active borrow, because if you then move the object, if you move your future, then its internal pointers are no longer valid and bad things happen. A solution to that is spinning, so they change the API of futures. You don't, you no longer get a mute self, you get a pin of mute self. The futures that can move around freely in memory implement the unpin trait. The ones that don't, that cannot move around in memory, don't implement this trait. Uh, and the pin thing allows underlying access only if you, ca you um, guarantees that your object does not move, sorry. The combination of pin and unpin makes the whole thing self safe, means that your futures cannot move in memory. More stabilizations are maybe coming, that's like the more distant future, there's no date about that. Uh, streams, async, async read, async read, async write. Uh, I invite you to talk to Josh or Stefan <laughs> if you want to learn about that. I'm not in the nose. Um, so, but this is like, uh, this is going to take a long time. Another thing that may happen in the future, uh, runtime and alternative to Tokyo. Uh, it's agnostic over which runtime to use. So you can use Tokyo, you can use something else that works differently, that's Cadios, your task differently, for example. It's less frameworky. Um, it's more like library-ish, which in my opinion is a good thing. And the maybe even more distant future, uh, IOU ring, that's a very recent API in the Linux kernel, allows doing asynchronous stuff without actually doing any syscall for like the, if you want the zero, zero overhead and not the zero, actually not the zero thingy. IOU ring makes it possible to have zero overhead. Uh, it's supposed to be way faster, but I, like people have commented that no benchmark has been written about that. So you just got to trust the theory. And that's it.
I suppose there are questions. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, so this past week, for the first time, I had to deal with like networking in Rust. Uh, for work, we had to write, or I had to write a gRPC server, and I ended up using this. I guess it could be called a framework called. Um, uh, Jesus, the name. I, I was talking about it like two seconds ago, and I forgot. It's not. It, uh, tower. Yeah, Tower. Thank you. So the Tower framework. Uh, I only used the gRPC part of it, but I was kind of wondering how Tower relates to Tokyo and Mio in this landscape. So the answer is I don't know. Uh, next question. No, I don't know. Uh, I actually never used to, uh, Tower because I'm not doing anything HTTP personally. So I haven't looked at all into the HTTP ecosystem. Uh, I don't know if someone else can answer. Well, sorry about that. <laughs> So they may be getting rid of the sync. Seems like sync is pretty fundamental. What is going to be instead of it? Okay, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> uh, no, so I wrote that we're getting rid of sync just because of a discussion with Yosh. Uh, <laughs> so, um, basically, instead of having sync, what I got explained is you would pull data and use async writes di directly. Like instead of like pushing objects into your sync, you just pull raw bytes. That doesn't seem to satisfy you, but. <laughs> Sorry? Uh, yeah, it's just that if you don't need to have something if if you can implement sync in a different way, it's not a bad idea to not have sync, in my opinion. Like, the more simple the thing is, the better, in my opinion. So you had this rule there about um, async not ready that the function, the feature should return async not ready if all of the underlying async not ready features are async not ready. I thought it's slightly different. It's like if at least one of them, right? Sorry, but we have only one microphone left. Um, uh, when a future returns not ready, it means it has, re it has registered the task. Uh, if if a future is ready, it has not registered the task. So if one of your under, underlying future has not returned not ready, you should not return not ready because it, it your task is not going to wake up. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm explaining this correctly. If you return ready, then you don't need to register the task because the caller is supposed to call Paul again immediately or in the near future. But if you return not ready, it can basically mean you sleep forever and unless one of your underlying future wakes up the task. There was another question. Yeah, uh, a question about uh, channels. So the user channels also a cross being library just to, to perform asynchronous tasks, so like a thread pool uh, synchronized by channels, would that be an, a solution? Uh, so cross beaming is not async friendly. Uh, the future scrape provides its own channels um, and basically works like you. The equivalent of cross beam is future channels. Uh, I heard there was a crossbeam equivalent, like, I heard there was an async equivalent of crossbeam in the work. Uh, I'm not sure where it is. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm not sure what was the question. Um, if you use your, if you use cross beam channels, for example, or channels in standard library, uh, they work by telling the operating system sleep until I call this method provided by the operating system. So you're basically telling the operating system the same thing you would tell to Tokyo if you used asynchronous channels. Like the point of Tokyo is to replace the operating system more or less. You still need a mechanism to wake up somehow, whether it's a native thread or a green thread. And CrossBeam is hard coded to native threads. Couple of questions. So, features are getting stabilized. I think a way it's getting stabilized. I've started as Bernardo said before, studying async Rust quite recently, and the main difficulty I had was documentation and just understanding what this post applies to, which version and, or combination of the different version of the different pieces that exist at the moment. So is the stabilization and the release gonna come with some kind of doc effort or is that gonna follow afterwards? And second question, what is the timeline expected or inferred for Tokyo to actually release on the new features? Uh, the answer is I don't know. <laughs> no. Uh, so next Thursday, we are like entering a transition period, I suppose. Uh, futures are stabilized, but you cannot really use them. It's like the first milestone, but I don't think it's a good idea to switch just yet. Tokyo is kind of switching to them. It's kind of blurry. Is it going to actually happen? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm also kind of observing. I'm not sure what's going to happen. Uh, the milestone of async await is going to be big because after that you can actually write stuff in stable Rust, and that's going to like make it possible to clean up a lot of dirty, ha like clean up the past basically. Uh, as whether, if you ask me in one year, will we still use Tokyo, will we use something else, I have no idea. Uh, yeah. Uh, I know that like the, the Rust teams are totally aware of that and they are trying to solve the issue. Um, I don't know how it's going to happen, but like it's true that it's extremely shameful that uh, we are like the fourth year since uh, Rust got released and there's still no like straightforward HTTP library that's like as performant as it could be. So yeah, but. Stabilizing uh, async await is like a big milestone, and then actual people can write libraries on top of that. You are no longer dependent on a stabilization to actually make it work. Okay, so you asked something similar to what I wanted to ask, but a partial reply to that is that uh, uh, actually Tokyo does provide uh, uh, a sort of converter, so uh, to convert uh, 0.1 futures into 0.3 futures and vice versa. And if you use them properly, it's almost transparent. In practice, it is transparent. So I tried using Actix and only write code with the, the preview of the async await with modern futures, and it just worked. Uh, Yes, exactly. So you had to, to, to use the compact properly all the time, but I if you knew that, you could be implicit, and so in practice, it just worked. So the actual question was, is actually Tokyo being transitioned so that uh, you will not need the compatibility layer anymore? Uh, 
uh, is this going to happen or what but probably you said you don't know so <laughs> well it has started but i don't know if it's going to uh, to actually like it's a tremendous amount of work uh there was one pull request that got merged recently that starts the transition but then you still have to do the rest i i haven't looked into the details of what was switched but even if you do the switch, you still have to rewrite all the documentation and everything. Uh, that's for Tokyo. I heard that the compatibility layer, which you talked about, is kind of buggy. Uh, and I've been recommended to not use it yet. Uh, yeah. I'm kind of taking the blame, but I don't know what to answer. <laughs> Any other question? Okay. We're set. Thank you.